In case you didn't know. Okay, if you can start now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, we didn't know how many people to cater for. And it looks like we're really under catered in terms of space uh, and food. Um, and that just shows how... I just wanted to say how appreciative I am that everyone's here. Um, but it's not to do with how appreciative I am. It's about Dad. And, um, and I know he'd be absolutely thrilled if he knew how many, what, how many people were here and the support he's got. Um, we've got a couple of speeches. Um, we've got hundreds of speeches. No, we've just got a few. There are some people who can't be here today. Uh, some in Australia, uh, others in other countries. And some of those people have asked people here to say a few words. So we're going to start uh, with Heather. Now, Heather. Oh, yeah, give her a nice round of applause. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Heather. <laughs> Heather, are you going to stand here? Yes, darling. Do you have a loud voice? I do. I'm going to clip this microphone on you yeah. because we're being taped so that okay. the Australian contingent can get a video. That is lovely. Can you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> you will, I promise. Okay, now I've got my reading glasses on. I am here on behalf of Jenny. Jenny Seams, you may not have heard of her, um, but she and I are fabulous friends and I was lucky enough to meet Brian and Patsy too. Um, 2019. And I am very, very pleased and honoured to be able to read this out. Anyway. Rock on. Right, my mate Brian Longhurst, <laughs> the protagonist, the deuteragonist, and triagonist, that'd be my sister. No, no, no. Anyway, or more simply put, stars had to align for our meeting to occur. And it just so happens they did, thanks to Brian, his two brothers, and soon to be sister in law. Terry already lived in Sydney. John and Claire were in Sydney to get married and Brian had accompanied them from the UK to be involved in the pending nuptials. It was 2008. I was working in a large hospital. This is Jenny, okay. I was working in a large hospital in southwest Sydney and the medical record department required more racking to hold paper records. I have a very bright sister. I love her to bits. She was headhunted to go to Australia. Sorry, just have to flag that up because I love her, okay? She's pretty special, not like me. I love horses, not people. Anyway, um, okay, sorry. Right, I telephoned a local company to get a quote and spoke to a gentleman called Terry. As negotiations on pricing and delivery started, I had to call Terry one day. As soon as I thought he answered, I started talking only to be stopped by a deep voice saying, hold on, hold on, this isn't Terry. To which I replied, well, who is it then? <laughs> and that's how I met Brian. He was sitting in Terry's car, bored, babysitting Terry's mobile phone and waiting for Terry, who was in a meeting. I was not to know that Terry had left strict instructions that Brian was not to answer his phone. <laughs> but when, <laughs> when did Brian ever do as he was told? Anyway, there followed a fast and humorous conversation between Brian and myself. He told me he had just purchased a convertible BMW and when he returned to the UK, he would be spending the summer driving around Europe. So I asked if he was married or had a girlfriend and would, not at that time he didn't, okay? Anyway, because I, I know my sister, she is pure. <laughs> Sometimes. Anyway, um, so I asked if he was married or had a girlfriend and would one of them be accompanying him? He said, no, I am going alone. So I cheekily asked if I could go with him. Brian then asked me to meet him if we were to go on our travels together in Europe, essentially to make sure we got on, <laughs> that I had a uh, personality that would thus not uh, be a psycho and likewise him. <laughs> 
We arranged a meeting on Saturday in Manly with him arriving on the ferry and us dining at the pantry overlooking Manly Beach. The weekend rolled on from lunch in Manly to a same day trip in Catacumba in the Blue Mountains, a two hour drive. Probably give them time to get to know each other, just a bit. Anyway, um, to meet Chris, a musician and his wife, Vicky. Who the hell are they are, I don't know. Anyway, if they're here, hello. <laughs> anyway, uh, and they were playing in a band. So, the lunch in Manly evolved into a weekend away and Sunday saw us enjoying the delights of the town of Lura and the scenic railway before returning to reality. <laughs> anyway, that summer, winter, winter in Australia, I flew to the UK and joined Brian in his fabulous convertible for an amazing trip around Europe. Leaving Plymouth by boat to Spain, we then drove in his modern car with sat-nav across Spain, over the Pyrenees and Andorra, through the south of France, into Italy, and then across the Alps into Switzerland. We would usually stayed in hotels, but as I have friends in the right places, we stayed for a few days with my Australian friends, Lindy and Rod, at Gland, just outside Geneva. After which we drove across France and took the ferry back to the UK. Three weeks of new experiences, incredible scenery, and many laughs as Brian loved my sense of humor. I love my sister's sense of humor too. She's a diamond. Anyway, right, later that year in October, uh, Brian came out to Australia for six months and the whirlwind of adventures continued. Does that sound like Brian? I think so. Anyway, in December, Cat and Paul came out to Australia and stayed on the northern beaches. Do you remember that, darlings? Yeah? Lovely time? Yeah. I'm so pleased. I'm so pleased. Anyway, they spent as much time as possible with Brian, family and friends and left again in January. When Brian stayed with me, he was flexible about food and would be happy just eating jam sandwiches. If I ran out of inspiration of meals, as I do not enjoy cooking, neither of us do. We hate cooking. <laughs> it's one of those necessities. Oh. Anyway, in March 2000 and Brian, oh no, poo, hang on, hold on. In March, I'm getting excited, <sighs> breathe. Um, in 2009, Brian returned to the UK and later that year I flew over and we spent time in Scotland touring castles, glens, locks and visiting my Highland family. A trip to Liverpool from the Australian Pink Floyd concert with Cat and Paul. Happy Love days, it. happy days. A tour of Yorkshire to visit friends and family while Brian still had his fabulous car, he indulged me in my passion for map reading and allowed me to tell him where to go. <laughs> Says it all. Bossy. She's ever so bossy. I'll tell you how he put up with it. No, no, no. That's <laughs> too much childhood stuff. I'm the younger one. More pretty. <laughs> sometimes. Anyway, I returned to Australia and later that year Brian was diagnosed with cancer of the colon for the first time. He had surgery and this was followed by a long course of chemotherapy. The following year when we had hoped to meet up again I was diagnosed with cancer and underwent a similar exhausting treatment regime with major surgery and radio radiotherapy. We were next to meet in person in 2011 when we had both recovered from our respective cancers and I was able to fly to the UK. By then, Brian had met the lovely Patsy. And soon after, I met up with an old boyfriend, Ian, who is now my husband. That, that story is just phenomenal. Jenny went out with this guy, he was her first boyfriend ever. And uh, we worked out there was 36 years between them and with no contact whatsoever. And <laughs> she friended him on Facebook. And he did say, when he said accepted the friendship on Facebook, he said, I think I'll be opening a can of worms here. 
<laughs> well, after that, you know, there was no looking back. <laughs> so he now lives in Australia with Jenny. And, and I love Ian to bits because uh, I know him very much too, which was just fabulous. So in the times where Brian and I could not meet in person, we met up on Skype and had long conversations or swapped text, me text messages to keep in touch. Patsy joined in many catch-ups on Skype and we became good friends exchanging messages on WhatsApp. And Jenny still extends her love to you, Patsy. Yeah. My husband, Ian, and I last met up in person with Brian and Patsy in December 2019, meeting for brunch in Clapton on Christmas Eve. I was there. I was there. Do you remember that? I was there too. It's a job to get me away from my horses. You know, I don't do social. If I hadn't had a whole shoulder joint operation two weeks ago, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> Happy days. Um, right, so I am enjoying this, thank you. <laughs> and thank you for inviting me. Well, Jenny. <laughs> anyway, by the time we got back to Australia, COVID had arrived and travel became impossible. Brian and I continued our friendship through COVID, through the recurrence of his cancer, and right up until the day he died. I will miss our chats and his contagious laughter, his pithy comments, his upbeat moods and enthusiasm for life. I'll go with you on that one, Brian. Thank you, Brian, for giving me the most amazing memories and for everything we shared from your larger than life, Aussie lady, Jenny. I'm the slim one. Okay. There is a, there's a, uh, she attached here one of her favorite photos um, uh, taken in Monaco on our trip around Europe, Brian and Jenny, Monaco, August 2008. So I'll leave this. Um, yeah, if you, if you would like to just keep it as a little memento of how, what an amazing dad. And yeah, okay, he was slightly outside the box, but we love him. <laughs> you know, he brought, he brought joy, happiness to so many. Yeah. And, Lots of ladies, but hey ho, you know, <laughs> hey ho. It's slightly out of the ordinary, but <laughs> darling, we love him, okay? You know, he was one in a million. So I'm very happy to be here to represent Jenny as one of those ladies who really loved Brian, and Brian cared, you know, he really did. He really made her, he came at a time in her life when she was very low. And he, he was just heaven sent. Hey, Pat? Yes. He heaven sent. Yeah. And he was a little angel that moved on. <laughs> so there we go. Thank you so much, Heather. That's an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Oh, let me take that. Oh, sorry, darling. Of course. Okay. The opportunity is here if anyone else wants to say something. I also have a speech, so you've got at least one <laughs> more. Dave has a little bit to say, hopefully. Yeah, Dave, go. Uh, We'll put that in a minute. Is anyone else like to say anything before I start? No, get on with it. Perfect. <laughs> Let me just open this. Um, Brian George Longhurst, the lovable bastard. <laughs> I think it's important that a speech like this should not only be about someone's life, um, but also share the essence of them and who they were. Uh, we should also spark conversation and encourage people to keep them alive in their memories. The good, the not so good, the funny, the sad, the mistakes and the successes. And that way we all have the maximum opportunity to become a little bit richer for knowing him and knowing about them. So this therefore won't be a, a filtered rose tinted perspective from an adoring son, but it's rather an attempt at an honest look at a man's life. And he did, after all, wear his faults on his sleeve. And it's that, I think, with his love of life that made him so frustratingly lovable for so many. So on the 21st of July in 1942 in Worcester Park, London, Rita and George had their first baby boy, Brian George Longhurst. And eventually he was to become the eldest of three brothers, John and Terry, following soon after. Uh, luckily, I had the time to, uh, to talk to him before he passed of his childhood memories. And he talks of a rubber dinghy in the, in the garden, 
filled with cold water and woolen swimming costumes. <laughs> a house full of friends as Rita, whose actual name was Emily, uh, seemed to let all the kids in from the neighbourhood at all times. There was a dump at the bottom of the garden and Pig Farm Alley, both of which brought days and days of happy exploration for the boys, fun and laughter. And during the war, Dad was sent to uh, Wallasey, where he was evacuated. He didn't remember much of that period, understandably, but he did talk of the return of him and his brothers playing with the three-wheeled bikes and, of course, the epic Green Lane Youth Club. <laughs> These years brought some incredible, long-lasting friendships, including Alan Palmer, Jeff Patterson, and my godfather, Dave Tuffin. And uh, <laughs> Dave's going to interrupt my speech in a minute and, um, and fill in some blanks from that time for us. Uh, there was a ping pong table, I'm told, and the title of champion was much coveted in the household between the brothers. Any challenge had to be accepted or the champion title would be lost. Many a time in teenage years would a brother be about to leave the house late to pick up a girlfriend when someone would shout, challenge! <laughs> what do you do? Do you lose your title or be even later for the lady? I'm told most of the time the ladies could wait and nothing could come between a longhurst <laughs> and a ping-pong challenge. <laughs> uh, he used to help his father out at Sunlight Laundry, occasionally to earn some pocket money. But his first real job was engineering, working at Mitcham, making metal tubes, which went on to build planes. In 1961, he got a job through his father, working in the print for the Daily Mirror. Uh, and it was, to me at least, a mind-numbingly boring job of checking that the printers had accurately recreated the journalists original article, looking for spelling mistakes and errors. Sorry, errors. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> it was a job he held for 27 years, and here some more really strong friendships were made. They called him Butty because of his penchant for jam sandwiches, uh, or jam butties, as they were known. Sadly, the friends he made there were mostly older, uh, and have either passed or are unable to make it today, but I have had many, many messages. In May 1966, Brian married Rosemary, his childhood sweetheart and fellow member of Green Lane Youth Club. I grew up in Wallington, Surrey, with mum, dad, and a dog called Penny. Uh, dad would always be making things. Uh, he dug a massive pond in the back garden and kept koi carp there. Uh, he built an entire double garage from a kit he'd bought. <coughs> he designed and made a go-kart uh, for me from wooden planks. Uh, he would be mixing cement for pathways, etc. Um, then there was his annual fishing trip to Ireland where he would go ledger fishing with the lads. In 1977, the marriage eventually fell apart and I went to live with Rita while mum moved in with a friend. <laughs> <laughs> True story. <laughs> while well, Dad lived alone in the family house. These were his bachelor years, and ones I know very little about, which is probably best. <laughs> I saw him often, and we had some great holidays in those years. Talking of holidays, Dad's favorite holiday was to just get in a car and drive. We would end up in Germany, for example. He'd just point to a road and say, I wonder what's down there, and we would just go. Uh, Rita, was famous for her catchphrase from the back of the car. What day is it and what country are we in? <laughs> Dad's ability to talk to everyone meant we were never lost and every trip was a massive adventure. By now I was living back with Dad in Wallington and eventually with Janet, who unfortunately can't be here today. Uh, luckily my awkward teenage years proved to be an absolute joy for everyone. And, and so there was very little drama. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. In 88, Dad was forced out of his job at the Daily Mirror as computers replaced much of the print workforce and so he took the redundancy money offered and with Janet, his partner at the time, they purchased a property and business in Devon with the clear intention of only staying five years. As you could have guessed 35 years later, we still have that property and anyone interested should contact me <laughs> ASAP to avoid all disappointment. <laughs> Seriously, it's a bargain. <laughs> uh, John uh, came back from Australia to work for Dad and Janet helping to run the business and lunch times were usually spent with a backgammon game between the two brothers and over the years we came to learn one thing 
that John was a lucky git. <laughs> His 30 year streak of luck in the game had nothing to do with skill, I'm told. Nothing at all. <laughs> Dad's life took him around the world many times. He visited his brothers in Australia a few times. He rode Route 66 across America with Miles. Watched Mark Stone in a journey become the world's class opera singer he is today. Cruising the Caribbean on the USS Canberra and many, many miles traveling across Europe on his bike and in the car. Looking around and seeing such a wonderful group of people, I know that if Dad were alive today, I have no doubt in my mind that he would actually be outside talking to everyone else in the pub. <laughs> about casual racism and how wonderful his genius son was. In fact, I understand he spoke about me a lot to everyone and anyone constantly. And for those who have just met me today, you must be wondering what all the fuss is about. <laughs> I can only agree one thing I say is that most of the successes I've managed to achieve are because I've been trying to live up to that legend that he created. As for hobbies, Dad loved many things. Primarily, he loved motorbikes and cars. His knowledge of cars, standard road cars, not, not necessarily even high-end performance cars, was vast. To be in a car with Dad was to hear the words, see that Hyundai, it's chassis is based on a 1998 Kia. <laughs> or something, to tell the truth, I didn't listen. He loved it. It's a love we didn't quite share. <laughs> uh, he had the wisdom to stop riding his beloved bike when he turned 70. Knowing his reaction times were probably waning, he just knew when to stop. It must have been a tough decision because he really loved his bikes. But it was taken easily and with absolutely no regret. And that sort of decision making is a talent that I think not many people share. Dad's main approach to life was to, to help people, and he did this for his own sake. He never publicized, publicized it. Um, he took in and parented boys who at the time didn't have strong father figures. Um, Dave Downton, Miles Holden are two examples here, especially Miles, who lived with us for years as I was growing up. And he created spong, strong bonds with others. A uh, significant example here is Mark, Mark Stone, providing me with new brothers as I grew up. But it's not just that. I personally know of drug addicts that Dad helped support through their rehabilitation. I know of homeless people he's helped, above and beyond giving them cash on the street. Even small things like the many, many people he just took to the theatre for the first time so they could have that experience. It was a gift and a fault of his. I know my inheritance would be a much more generous if it wasn't for this <laughs> part of his character. But it's still one of the parts I loved him the most for. One of the last wishes uh, he had for me was to give most of the people, forgive people for the loans he's made to them. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> you wouldn't have known it by talking to him, but he became a sort of cancer magnet in his later years. Skin, colon, liver, lungs, liver again, and finally a bout of liver, lungs and brain cancer to end them and him once and for all. After the last cancer diagnosis, he once knew the right time to stop. He asked for palliative care rather than cancer care and never looked back. Just no regrets. No regrets for sympathy, no requests for sympathy, just another easy decision made, so let's get on with it. His actual final words to me were about community. He died happily, which is a strange thing to say, but he genuinely did. He knew he'd left on... Oh, Jesus. He knew he'd left the people he cared about surrounded by the people he could they could rely on. His happiness was that he would knew he, we would all look after each other and that we would all be okay. And talking of community, this seems like a good time <laughs> to hand over to Dave, one of his enduring friends. Dave, would you mind wearing this? <laughs> Love to. Very kind. I haven't finished yet. I'll be back. I'll be back. I'll be back for the, uh, for the close. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned your inheritance. I'll be talking to you about that later. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> this was it, was it? As, um, <laughs> as your father's uh, very wise choice of executor, yeah. uh, I have ultimate power. <laughs> uh, You're always my favourite. No, <laughs> now that Mark's busy singing around the world and... Uh, Anyway, we'll get to it. Don't worry about it. I don't want you to worry. 
<laughs> right, um, this won't take all that long. It'll be a bit rambling because I don't have any notes at all, but it's recollections. Um, how did I get involved with the Longhurst family? Well, I wish I hadn't because four, <laughs> four people, when I came in, said, oh, you must be one of the brothers. You die as brother. <laughs> Not in so many words, but um, if we go back to 1970, uh, 1963, when I joined the, um, the aforesaid... Green Lane Youth Club, I met Terry Longhurst, uh, the youngest of the, of the brothers, and uh, we struck up a friendship which is still enduring to this day. So um, I didn't know of Brian then because he was too old and left the youth club, but I did meet him later on uh, together with his lovely wife Rosemary, or Bud as we called her, uh, when they lived in, uh, in Wallington in Demean Road. Terry and, uh, not sure about John then, I think he may have gone to Australia, Terry lived in, uh, in uh, 16 Rygate Way in Wallington. And uh, we spent many times there, particularly at Christmas, because I don't know about you people, but your own family Christmas is all right to start with till you've had the presents. Then it's really boring, isn't it? Your mum's got the telly on, your dad's asleep, so you want to go out. So we used to go out, much to my mother's uh, chagrin. And uh, we used to go over to Rygate Way and have party games. And the instigator of these party games was none other than Paul's dad. And they, I'd never seen anything like it before. And I'll give you an example of how classy these games were. <laughs> it used to be... I know what's coming. It, <laughs> it used to be, let's blindfold the girls. So they all go in one... <laughs> settle down. Don't let your imaginations run away with you. All the girls would go in one room, all the boys would be in the other, and we'd co construct a chasm out of seat cushions with a gap in, in, the, in the middle. A girl victim would be <laughs> led in blindfold, not, not, we didn't do the tying up, no. it was just blindfold, and they would be made to walk, span this chasm and walk along, right, guided like that, and they would right to the end and the lights would be on, and they'd take the blindfold off, and they'd look behind them, only to see somebody like John <laughs> laying full length on his back like that, <laughs> grinning. And that was funny, apparently. <laughs> One of the many happy hours we spent there. Um, what else happened? Oh, yes, we, uh, we did the youth club. I've known Brian, knew Brian, for 60 years, which is quite a long time. And uh, he was uh, an excellent friend, I'm not going to reiterate how much of a, a good guy he was. He was every man's dream, if you like. Uh, some of the men are not here now, but Terry's friends. Um, sorry, that fell a bit flat. <laughs> I'm, I'm not very woke. So anyway, uh, yeah, so he finished up being best man at my wedding. Uh, the reason he was best man rather than Terry was that Terry was so laid back, he was horizontal, so I'd never have got married. And Brian had a car, it's as simple as that. So, but but it, it worked well. It worked well. So uh, what else have we got? Excuse me. Be right with you. Talk amongst yourself. Yes, George and Rita, you mentioned. Grandpa and granddad. George was a lovely guy. Uh, not the best of health, and uh, unfortunately he died of cancer far too early. But Rita was an absolute princess. In fact, um, she used to say to me, particularly on a Sunday afternoon when we were over there, she'd say, David, yes, Rita, she'd say, why can't my boys be like you? <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was heartrending. It was heartrending. Um, there are some say, I didn't know I was too young, but there are some say that I was the fourth brother that she had to keep secret because it was, <laughs> because it was just after the war. But I'd, I don't know. Anyway, I grew up okay, I suppose. Uh, yeah, he worked on the Daily Mirror, didn't he? And, and Terry used to go, uh, used to get a job in Fleet Street on Brian's behalf. He used to sign him in. And they'd go up there on a Saturday and work for one hour, book in for eight hours, and, and get in those days with a lot of money, about 50 quid. Uh, and it was called Stringing Up. A bit of a history lesson. They had a conveyor belt where choirs of newspapers, so 400 newspapers, would come down. And when they got to there, somebody would pull up a piece of string from there and there and lay them across the top. It would then go into a machine which would tie the knot. And they would go like that <laughs> for one hour, sign in as Mickey Mouse, and come home with 50 quid. That's, that's your rich heritage, that boy. <laughs> 
The dog called Penny, I'm sure they left her behind several times, you know. They were so disorganised, oh, your family. Yeah. Jen, we, we left her at the top of a hill once. Yeah. We'd stay, you know, when you, you're training a dog to stay. We walked down the hill talking, <laughs> forgot the dog. <laughs> <laughs> Up the next hill talking, forgot the dog, down the next hill to the car park, and someone went, Where's the dog? <laughs> we had to come back up the first hill. <laughs> Benny! <laughs> about a mile away, still sat there waiting for us. Yeah, many times. I still hear the recurring voice of your, your father shouting, Penny! Yeah. Penny! That's, that's how we used to call. Anyway, nostalgia. Um, I'm going to finish now because uh, time's getting on and it's way past my nap time. I normally have a nap at this time of the afternoon. But I want to tell you again about the classiness of this family. Absolute classiness. Uh, my late wife, um, Brenda, was with me uh, at the time. And um, we were invited over on a Sunday afternoon to Demean Road. It was a lovely day. I think I was playing heading tennis with Terry in the garden and generally just looning about. And uh, Brian said, uh, oh, you've, you've, got to come in the, you've got to come in the back garden now. We've got a projector set up. I said, oh, what's that for? And he said, well, I've got some mate's holiday snaps. I said, I don't want to see them. He said, no, you've got to see them. I was really a bit stroppy because I didn't want to sit in, on a sunny day watch somebody's holiday photographs. <laughs> Anyway, they said, oh, you sit in the front, Dave. So they got some seats laid out, so I, I sat in the front like that. <sighs> really bored, you know, fed up, <laughs> wanted a beer. And uh, anyway, he said, right, is everybody ready? Yeah, OK. The projector went on. He had a Super 8 projector. And on came the most disgusting <laughs> por pornography <laughs> that I'd ever seen up until that time, <laughs> since Paul showed me his collection. <laughs> um, but it was the worst Are you I'd. For the <laughs> <laughs> it was the worst I'd seen up to that time. But uh, class act, Paul, class act, all the way, all the way. But ju just to say that, uh, obviously, we'll all miss Brian. Oh dear. But not me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm just going to take that back. I want that. No, it's mine. Uh, I just want to finish up, really. Um, his last few years were his happiest. I asked that specific question. When were you the most happy? He said, now. Uh, living with Patsy in Devington Park and the community that he'd built there, seeing his special friends, uh, the relationship he'd built, the simplicity of just creating moments with people he loved and cared for, and the small things in life. He took a lot of joy about seeing me flourish with my wife. Cat. It just made him very happy. I remember as a teenage, teenager hating him. I, I honestly wished him dead with a passion many times. He was hard to like sometimes. And I, I had to be the one that gave in and I hated him for that every time. He never budged. It was his rules, his house, and he was very much this father. And it took me a while to stop pushing against that and, well, just grow up, grow up, I guess, yeah. Once I'd done that, I found the truest friend. Um, we spoke daily. And it's not an exaggeration, we spoke daily for about 20 years. We laughed a lot, he shared everything with me, a little bit too much, <laughs> to tell the truth. <laughs> that I'm so grateful for such a strong presence in my life and for so long. And I will really miss him. He did tell people what he thought of them and their choices, and it lost him some friends. It lost him quite a few friends across the years, but it strengthened his relationship with many, many others. He was ever loyal. People left dad, he didn't leave them. And that's why when uh, some of the more people in his life left him or treated him badly, it's all the sadder for me and those who love him because he would always remain loyal to them at the end, despite it all. But in his own actual words, life with me will never be dull. Sometimes it's shitty, <laughs> but it'll never be dull. So he was funny, stubborn, loved his family, his community. He was kind, hard, loved his tech, but didn't understand it. <laughs> he dressed well, he was silly, loved music, hated falls, but at all times he tried his best and that's all you can ask of anyone. And so his end journey ended as it, as it could. It's up to us to keep his spirit alive 
And to that end, we all have a gift for you, if you want it. <laughs> These all contain small amounts of dad's ashes. If you want to, please feel free to take one. Uh, if it would mean anything to you to distribute it however you see fit, you might want to put it down the toilet. I don't know. <laughs> I don't mind, but there are some here. If it's gone by the time uh, you get here and you want some, we have plenty more that we can uh, send out or give. Um, so that's up to you if you want to, to make the memory of my dad your own and to keep him with you as you see fit. We, we mixed all the ashes well, so in each one there is a little bit of his heart and his bum hole. <laughs> Um, I didn't ask everyone to charge their glasses, but uh, if we could um, maybe just be upstanding. Brian Longhurst, you lovable bastard. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, buddy. Wow, there you go. Uh. <laughs>